in a very subjective way. So this question in German art, from, I will talk of one of only, of Hans Erich Nosek, a German writer who wrote in the 40s, which has become to me a very important uh, writer. The were the German artists were the first who began to deal with this question of history. And so all this concept comes from a very subjective way of thinking, even if you write nowadays, uh, it can be institutionalized very easily. So it is in this uh, space that I will discuss and uh, I will try to show you uh, something coming out from my workshop. This is my workshop. Maybe we can get some light off. Uh, what you see there is my workshop that uh, once it has been uh, separated into two spaces in the occasion of this exhibition in 2011. And it is an, one of the installations of all my models and maquettes that are a very important part of my work that I show only every five or ten years. I reorganize all the models of my work to construct a kind of atlas, a kind of of element that reconstruct the relation between all my works. So we will go through some of those, even if maybe formally you don't recognize it, the models are my, uh, this is a kind of brain, that's a mapping of my brain that I have to put outside. And in this mapping there are several things that are images, histories, forms, materials, processings. So it is now existing since 2011 in my studio I lived with it and it's a quite uh, interesting way to, to think for me. Um, I will try to make, um, yesterday as I began my course I said I have been working for 20 years and then someone told me no it's 30. So I, I have, I did very much with time in my work so I, I forget time and it is 30 years so I have to to, to, I will step back, not at the very beginning, but in the 90s. And I will uh, show you one show in the beginning of the 90s in a particular social condition that is the beginning of uh, the wars in, um, in uh, Iraq. It is the first war in Iraq and it was put, it was running this, uh, this kind of information you could see on our televisions, this is CNN, but you could see it on all television through Europe, where the only image we had of the war at the time, that were images by, by soldiers uh, produced by the, the American <coughs> army. Um, to remember the context, um, Iraq uh, had um, invaded a little petroleum state nearby and the sanction was to bomb them, to bomb Iraq and the effect of the war was not the same uh, as it was defined by the UNO only, only how are you saying this? Uh, I, 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 I I'm lost in languages but uh, it doesn't matter about the world organization United Nations. United Nations. Okay. <laughs> the United Nations was to stop the invasion, but the war in fact was very different. It has been the destruction of all the Iraqi army. And it, it has, uh, as you see in the data, it was very short and very brutal. But we didn't have any image of this war at the time. So I was invited in 91 uh, in these days. It was the, the putting up the exhibition in a museum in Prato. That is a museum uh, that did the first exhibition of my generation, so I was in with two of these artists. I was working in my, my own gallery group of artists, uh, artist run space. And uh, I, this kind of space was very special. You see the rooms are two, 12 meters by 12 meters, 6 meters high with any window. And, uh, the architect didn't end his project so well, so, so he, he began, it was one room after the other in a kind of half circle, but he didn't end the, the, the way to get out. So you had to step all, through all the 12 rooms and come back. 
And he did another, uh, another, I forget also the problem that in museums you have works to hang, and so you need to put them, to get them into the rooms. He forget to, to, to construct uh, uh, somehow the, the way art was can come into the space. It was only a very small uh, way to get up. So at the end he did uh, um, a hole in the last wall that could be opened and I used this hole for my exhibition. I will not speak very much on the other works. Let's say that I, I opened the museum at the end of the museum with a very big glass of six meter high, three meter large, that with the name uh, the large glass as, as the glass of Tisha. Um, the other works um, that are there, I will not discuss them so very, it's not very quickly. Let's say that this is, is a prom work of the 80s I did. It, it, it's a cast of, of lead that is heated from, from outside. As you see, these are elements used to heat the petroleum containers when they are stuck in cold places. So I was heating the lead, so that the air was full of lead, and and the and the space was quite empty. There were this kind of things here, these elements, where kind of cabins you can step in, and the mattress of the cabins was a question I was talking with much. I will talk a little bit about this. So this opening, the my space was empty quite. But all the pieces were on the door, and. Uh, after the empty space, you had an empty window, you looked through the window. So what is important for me, it was a very important experience because I was working on a political issue for me. Opening up the museum in a culture like the 80s in which we were working in white cubes. White cube has become the standard at this time. So let's say 75, you had still performing in New York working in the meat districts, in, in industrial spaces. At the beginning with the 80s, the spaces the, the, had become white cubes. So the white cubes has no window and is a perfect abstract space where politics and social uh, issues are at the time. It was important to me that the relation to the outside is, is a perceptive complex relation. And I show you here the picture of the only exhibition uh, Marcel Duchamp did of the large, large glass. Uh, it, it, it is a photo by Man Ray in the exhibition of 26 in Brooklyn Museum. You see that uh, the, the work of Duchamp uh, is based on transparency, so that the shapes you, are, you have on the picture that are painted are a very, very complex construction of machinism. I don't really talk so much about it, but my work deals very much with this, mainly with the inventor of the small Picard and Duchamp. But what is what interests me mainly is that in in the ground in the, the large glass of, Picard, of uh, Duchamp you have something to see, to look at, and in the same time what is behind the historical background, the horizon is working with what you see. So here in the exhibition you see the works of other artists. If you look at now, it's in Philadelphia, now it's supposed this way. You have doors and windows and other works behind. All the shapes that are behind are working with the form. For, it's for me interesting because Duchamp was thinking of this uh, non-connections in time, the time of the picture and his historical life would have always horizons that are changing behind them. What it happens with my uh, large glass is that there is nothing to see on the glass. So there is any, any form, any shape, and you have to look through the window. Yeah, you see the world, you see, the, you see some, some housing in the nearby the museum, it's with any interest. But the question for me that was important it was what I see when I have to see something. Said in other words, what, what happens when there is no shape, no form, but my perception gets active. So do I see when I see, even if there's nothing to see? And the question and we are working on now in our class those days is what is the subject? 
what is an identity, what is someone who looks, what is behind my head, in my head, in my memory when I look at something, and what is the object I look at when I'm asked to look at. So when you have nothing to see, the question is, is there something to see? Is, and you see the question is a little bit different if I say, do I see something? Or is there something to see? Well, do I see something? Is yes, I see houses. I see something. I see a glass of houses. But is there something to see? It's an ethical question. It's a political question. It's a question of, this, of the significance. It's signification. And do I have to see something? So what was the step after, or let's say, one more, more thing that was very important to me. I've been working in the 80s before this installation on works like these panels you saw in the room before, in which uh, I was working on the difference of perception. Let's say that when I look to something, then I want to, to build a chair. I will build it a little bit too big. Because the imagination, the perception that I have on myself when I project myself in space, I'm a little bit bigger, but it's not because I have a big ego. Everyone, most everyone, sees himself a little bit bigger. So that I was working since the 80s very much on the question, what does it mean to have a dimension in practical experience, in physical experience of space, and what does it mean when I add to this perception, physical perception in space, the imaginative perception of myself in this space. And what I, I did the step after was the same year, I did an exhibition away open big space in Florence, in which I, I closed the door with two steps. The steps are constructed in a way that the body is feeling the difference of the steps, and the space is a little bit closing up, so that you are paying much, much attention physically to your body, how you are stepping up. And when you step up, you, you get on an open space in which uh, your feet are on three meters high, so your body is a five and a half meter high, and you are in space, in nothing, exposed to the danger to fall down. And what interests me very much in this moment was the question, what happens in this moment when I step up? Let's say I'm concentrated on my body, I have to put my feet, I feel myself as physically present. And when then I step up in this empty space, somehow I begin to feel myself in danger and I'm now in two moments. Shall I pay attention to my body or shall I look in this emptiness? So it's very romantic German attitude, the emptiness of the spleen. Is there to see something? Shall I look at something? Shall I see something? Do I see something? Or what shall I see? The ethical question. Is the question of, of this moment of becoming conscious that I'm looking at nothing. But I'm looking at, I'm projecting myself in something. So what interests me very much in this question is this moment when I organize my perception. And uh, what was the main, the main uh, question for me? And they gave the title to my piece as Räumen. Räumen is a German uh, word that is a resin of a German word to which you can add auf, Räumen, ein, Räumen. That's how, uh, that means you can arrange your room, auf, Räumen. You can ein, Räumen, add something to the space. Raum, space, is an active uh, word, Raum, an active way of making space. And this is the name of that Heidegger used to, to explain the relation between art and space. And it interests me, now I understand it much better than at the time, but it interests me much more, is the question that before you can, that you can give any sense to what you do, you have you make this first action that is Räume. And the, the example that Heidegger gives is this of the forest. We are in a very German forest with all the trees the same, the same distance. 
and then in a moment there is nothing, there is a space, light comes in, and then you feel space. You have an order, you get in another order, and in this moment you make Roman, you make space. And what in Heidegger it's thinking was to me very important in this idea of Roman, you produce space as a subjective experience and you make space become a place. In English it works very well. That means that the space is not a neutral given, a neutral given dimension, but the space is an inhabiting space. I'm producing an image on this space. I'm producing myself as a projector on this space. So this works, the title is Roman, and the importance of this was for me the question in this moment of decision, I have to take a decision if I see something. So going back to the political issues that I couldn't resolve so much in this first experience of the big glass, of the large glass, the idea was that if I have to see something, what does that mean that I'm asked to understand something, to see something? I, the, to come to this work, the, influ the main influence I would say would certainly has been certainly the experience I saw in the 80s uh, in a collection in Varese, the, the, the corridors of Bruce Nauman. This is a performance, this is performance corridor of uh, 69. And the first piece Nauman did is this. It is a corridor, it's a film in a corridor in which Nauman defines the dimension of the corridor by a contraposto. I will not talk about what is contraposto, it's an invention of Michelangelo, how the bodies are turned in Michelangelo's painting. But the contraposto here is the moving of the body by walking that defines which is the dimension of the corridor. And I was very impressed by this work of Nauman, in which the dimension is defined like you see it clearly here, the mansion is defined by a body going through, but what I see is a space that is not good for the body. There is any dimension of the body in perception. So this was really for me the beginning of work, of my, my personal work. And the second question that was very important in this time is this piece of Walter de Maria, Light and Fields. It is a very strange experience because you have to travel a very long time to go there and there is nothing to see. There are hundreds, every hundred meter you have a stick for waiting for some, uh, some lightings. So it's a lighting field. It's, it will, it could, it would, if there was going on something, capture all the lightings coming down from the sky. And it was interesting to me the question that if I look at this very minimalistic piece, there is nothing to see, but I see this. In my head, I see this. So how does it work that from there, I come to there? And this is for me a very important question. What does that mean that I perceive something? And if we go back to the political issues, what does that mean that I recognize, let's say, rape? that I recognize violence. What does that mean to see violence? That's coming back to what I said in the beginning. I don't agree that there is truth because the truth has to do with a subjective way of seeing it. I have to do the work to see it in the shape is not enough. So this was uh, one of the, of the big elements that I was working on. And and I have to say that I, I couldn't resolve the question of the politics. One of the important elements that brought me to the work very much that it, at the time I did the, the large class, I was dreaming at night, I have awful uh, dreamings, I have very often important It will become better, you deal with what you have to memorize or not. When you're young, it's very complicated. But I had awful dreamings of the war in Iraq, because I didn't see the war. So where were coming these dreams from? I'm half German, I'm half Italian, I have memories in my family that are linked to, to, terror, to, to terror and war, in all the directions, in the bad ones and in the good ones, in the fascist one, in the resistance. Uh, 
I have a memory of history of war, but I have from the from the generation of the boom of the European richness. So I didn't grow up in, in war. I have saw films about war, so very much. I have a German, I have been a German public school, so at my time in German public schools you have to look at the film about Shoah with all the class. So I saw the opening of the camps, I saw this kind of memories that were given to German uh, young uh, students to look at. But you see in the what was happening when I did, we did this large class is that there was a, a separation between what the television was showing and what, what I knew that war was and it didn't fit. And in my work I was working with two things you couldn't see, the intention to look at something and the empty glass. So I was, was working of emptiness, of absence, but I had been heavily charged with uh, things that were uh, very, uh, very strong. So one of the steps I did like is, is uh, I was working very much of machines, so, so I will not talk about this because I, I stopped the, the clock, so I, I don't know since how, now how much I'm talking. But I'll let you tell me if it becomes too long. Yeah. I, I made an exhibition in 2000, this is the opening of, uh, of Michelin in Paris. I, I, I made an enormous machine that is a little bit higher than you, so when you stand by, you, you cannot see it really good. You see two little machines like trains, like a child's or uh, playing with trains, I, I built two little trains, and these little trains go out and in the center of this machine. So sometimes they are arriving together, sometimes not. The title of this machine is a very long title get from, from, Picabes, from two Picabes pictures and it's about the machine idea of sexology that was very important in, in, in Picabes work. Picabes did erotic machining portraits in the, only in the years of the First World War. The, the, the drawings begin in 13 and ended in 19. So it was very interesting for me to understand that Picabes did this machining drawings and all what we now call machinism only in the years of the war, in the years in which the machines were employed in the First World War, the First War in which machines were employed to destroy so massively and with efficacy human beings. And so in this exhibition you step in, you have a machine that's double, with a double function, it makes sex with itself, not much more it works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it works didn't work. So they are always running and then on the side you have photographs that are done with a, a big photograph machine. You know the machine you can order in space with so these big old machines. I have been photographing some oh, some drawings I did. These are the drawings. And these drawings have been a very important uh, shift in my work. I do drawings without knowing why I do drawings very often. They are very machine, machine. I do it automatically. So here the process is very simple. I make two holes in, in, the, in, the, in the paper and then I, I, I let fall down some uh, wax that I can see because it's like a paper. And then I try to, to get the center of my hole by a pencil getting something. So that is the only thing I do and then I turn it back into the back center. This is machinically done. But was it was important what I was doing with drawing, that I was thinking about some of the accurate snow that did in the last years of the war. Emil Nobel was an expressionist artist who, who was painting flowers and God mainly. He was a very naive artist somehow in politics. And then he was very surprised to be an after the conflict. And then he was an he was not allowed, not more to continue to paint and get back to Denmark, his, in his village, where he, he did not have any uh, permission to paint. So he did very small aquarelles like this on the seaside. And all these aquarelles of the seaside have some holes because he made it very quickly and there are holes in the sea. 
And I was so impressed by the souls of uh, Nolde because I, my thinking was Nolde has no more horizons, so he has no more object to paint. These paintings are named the Ungemalten Bilder, the Ungemalten Bilder, the, the, the paints not painted, the paintings not have, that have not been painting, painted. So, I mean, not the made holes, let, let somehow open spaces in this uh, aquarels. And my thinking was, he has no more origin. Before he has his God, Christ, he was making very much picture on Christ. And, and uh, compassion and uh, nature and life. And in these last years, there's no more than materials of the sea with the souls. And I was thinking that the horizon has smashed down. So after the war, of India, the last years of the German war, a painter has no more horizon, has no more horizon. What that, that does mean that there are no more shapes. So last year, here, I talked about sprouts of shape and horizon. But the question is, you can make any shape if you have not in outside and in your head two horizons of shapes. Beginning with this, you can think. How can you do a picture if you don't know pictures? You have to know pictures to make a shape, to make a form. So, what does it mean that the, that the end of the energy of my eyes are my eyes? So that the holes are the, 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 the last point of the perspective and are the beginning point of the energy of my looking. This was the, the thinking when I did this drawing. So what I did with the photographs is I have been hanging these drawings on, on um, copper, um, copper, um, what do you say? Well, it doesn't matter. It's hanging in an empty space and then you have some sticks on copper that are holding two lamps. The lamps are behind the drawing. Here. And from the ceiling is hanging a young, a young woman of 14 years that has been killed in a tool. Sadana Thief gave me this, this uh, thing he, he buys some as he was student in Bush. So this young uh, scalp of a young woman is hanging in the perspective, in one, another perspective than the eyes through the eyes, and the lamp is behind the eyes are the energy that give lights to the picture. But I photographed it in color and printed it in black and white, so that I have a negative. And the light has become black material. We will talk with my students tomorrow, after tomorrow, a little bit more about Joseph Boys, but because the title of title of this is a performance of Joseph Boys, but I will not enter this question. But what is important to me? to explain to you to, to, that you understand that I, under, I understood with this exhibition that the question of horizon was very important. When I opened the window, I opened also an horizon, not only an empty space. That it's beginning with the real political and social war, as it is in time, outside of the museum, that the forms that were inside the museum can be written and can be have a signification. So in my exhibition, until this exhibition, I cannot more exhibit without constructing horizon that I see. And the horizon has become the real question. So the question has become in a moment in my work, what does it happen in the outside on this extreme limit? What is an artist that has no more horizon? So I'm not even know that I didn't live in the, in the time of Antarctic Kunst. But I lived in, in the time of, an, of a new way of Antarctic Kunst that is the market of art. I came from a country, and my career began in Italy, in a country in which neoliberalism was this extreme, that the art world was quite destroyed by neoliberalism. And the new generation that came out of this, like uh, Cantelan, their strategies were based on sophism and humor humor to, re to reconstruct a way of, of dealing with political and, and artistic issues. So, um, what I thought in this time was that it was no more possible to work without any horizon. What I did the step later, this is in two years, the same, just, no, I don't know, one year later, 
I've been exhibit, I've been working in Israel and Palestine and Bezalel. And then I I did photos as everyone did photos. Yes. I don't do any photos anymore now. But at the time I was thinking do it photos which can be a kind of memory for myself for working. And I, I constated that all my photos are so bad, that are so bad tourist photos or so bad documentary photos. But even in these categories, they cannot be looked at. And I was very shocked by the fact to be someone who works on images since he is born. And then when he travels, he makes so bad photos that you can see nothing in his images. And I was very impressed by this question in Palestinian. It was the beginning of the new Intifada, of the second Intifada at the time. That I could not take any picture what that was really saying something about the situation. So what I, I did to resolve the problem is to say, okay, so let's change the method. You are so bad in taking light waves, they take sound waves. And so I built somehow a, a, a photographic machine that is very simple, I used two micro microphones. Instead of, uh, of using a machine that where the light comes in, I used two, microphone, two microphones and I've been walking, making the sound of the place I was uh, going through. Then the second intifada began as I get the money and I get all the things to be in the middle of the world. I didn't want to, to, to have the, the, the documentary of dead people or the documentary of this kind of violence, because what I was looking for was the war in his, in his non-visible form, not in the form of violence. So what I decided it, it was very stupid, as artists can be stupid. I said, okay, the center of the war is not only where the violence is, the center of the war is where the money comes from. So let's go to another center. And I, got, I went to Wall Street. I went to New York and I've been living a month in New York with headphones on two microphones and I was living only with my microphones, stepping all through the street. I did mainly all the streets of Manhattan and some, some good part of Brooklyn. Working, walking every day on the month, getting some uh, sound. And then I came back to Paris to develop this at the time to develop this image is about 11, meter, 11 meters by 2 meters, so it's a very big image, it was very complicated, so it takes the time. And in this time, the 11th, September 11th happened. And um, so I've been looking for the war in New York on April 2001, and when in September I was now editing my images, history has become much more quick than that I could imagine. So that uh, I could not imagine <laughs> September 2001, it's clear, but it, it gets faster than me somehow. So the first I, what I did was, was Wall Street. This is, this is, uh, the, this is are the Twin Towers of Wall Street. These are the Twin Towers. It's in the moment where the works of the Twin Towers get out and I'm filming it. What is important, I'm, I'm recording, was it important to me? To, to be quick, is the fact that these images are documentary images in the real sense of the term. I did photographs in a given place, in a given moment, with all the criteria of reality documentation. But what is was important to me is that you cannot recognize reality documentation. So, what you see, now I, I can read them because I, think I, I become expert in this question, so I can read them now. But what is important to me is that these waves are saying you something about horizon, and you can even see a city if you want, you can even see the, the sky in New York if you want, but you cannot recognize something so that you are in front of the same problem I had 10 years before. Is there something to see? And the question, when you read the, the little description, you can have an intuition of what politically it means 
do I have to see something? Or do I see something? But the question was to me very important to create a situation in which the individual cannot recognize what is the political issue. The way I expose the pieces, this is, this, is, this is another exhibition, but this is the form of the first exhibition, is that I continue to want to use the same, the same construction as you saw in the first exhibition in Michel Laurent. There is a machine, and then behind the machine there is an horizon. The machine is working with sounds. I, 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 I don't discuss this, this technical question, but I'm very interested in form also how it works, so harmony. This, the, the choice of this program is a program of harmonics and harmonics is a quite uh, precise structure in wave as the light is a wave, as the sound is a wave so I construct a, a kind of canoe of, of bombing machine but it bombs only sounds it is an organ and the, the, the deepest sound it's a, a, an A minor this, it's an A this is beneath the limit of what we can hear. So we don't hear the big, the, the deepest sound. We hear only the, the, the five others. But the capacity of the sound is, this is an invention of, of the Baroque time in, in construction, in music construction. If you develop the harmonics, you can make a sound very efficient. So when you are in space and the sound is running, the sound is going through your body and you hear it as it is really an important sound, but it's not loud. So the sound also is produced by the viewer. If the viewer is silent, nothing happens. But if it talks, if he talks, and in my idea, if he says, is there something to see? <laughs> the machine begins to sound and traverses all the space. In this, uh, Exhibition, there were also um, gongs, but I will, if I have time, talk later. To let you show how I work, this is the way I work. So, this is an image I sent to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 um, to an artist who wanted to do an exhibition, and I said, This is my project. You see, you see I work with models, and um, this is the model of uh, in 2003. It's, it's image and I have been working for uh, six, seven years of this, on this material so that this piece here has become a piece well inspired by, by, by Buckminster Fiddler who did this first geodesic form with three sticks. You see the sticks here? They are not fixed. They are free. So that every stick defines its position. And by defining his position, it is discovered that it becomes a perfect globe. And then discovered what in the 80s has been discovered as one of the main structures in skins, in uh, nanostructure skins in nature. So my, my, my Fulleran, because the Fuller, it's named the Fulleran, this kind of architecture, is a Fulleran that you build like a Fuller structure from up down. But it is fixed in this, in this dimension of natural uh, forms that uh, Buckminster Fuller discovered in 1757. And when it starts, when it becomes to the end, she became cancer. And there is one form that is not right. So when hexagon becomes a septagon, and I construct in all my models uh, uh, an error. So the perfect structure becomes a non-perfect structure and becomes to move like a, like a strange element that is not more perfect. This is one of the... And if you see the, what happens in the same year, so Claude Portland was always uh, all a very long work I did with bells. Bells are, in harmony, bells are natural harmonic structures. What was very interesting to me that I wanted to, to, to make a bell that has a different form. So I, I learned, I'm very technical, so I learned the, the work. I became caster, and then, then I became caster, I cast my bell. And then uh, the work continues. So sometimes the work stays three, four, five years because I need uh, to, to learn myself to use my hands. So 
So here I cast the bell. It is a bell that is ringing every 47 seconds. And you see in another exhibition, this is the same exhibition as the organ, the horizon is the city and is no more the, the Manhattan horizon. But what is important to me that the bells are dedicated and this is 20 end, the end of 20th century. I'm ringing every 47 seconds. That is a rhythm you cannot memorize. You can memorize every kind of rhythm when you hear every kind of music. You can even learn mathematics by hearing music because your brain takes out the, the noise, the attention to the noise, automatically when it is repeated. Here it is repeated, but it is repeated in a rhythm that you cannot explain. That even in, in now, uh, still now, when it is opening, I'm always convinced that the machine breaks. And it doesn't work, because the time, you can never expect this time. It's too long and it's too fast. And you are always in a condition of non-corresponding to the time that the bell gives. And the bell is a bell, so like down in space. These are, these are all the works I did at the same time, burning the skulls of animals I find in my Tyrolean woods. When I walk around, there are seven animals that are shot by persons who, do, who should not shoot these animals, and then they cut off the heads. You have all the, the, the last uh, hole in the in the in the skill in the skull, and then I, I used all the these are the elements for, for in working of, of uh, bronze. This is the way the bronze came into the piece. So you see the bronze is cast through this, and then you have the piece. And when you do bronze, then you cut it out. So I left all the structure of the piece and the. Uh, and the skulls are having in, the, in their teeth, they're holding uh, a gong. So that in the exhibition you can make them uh, sound. And it's very important to me this ritual to make re uh, vibrate something that has got to death. It's one of the theories of the, of the origin of music. Using skins of animal, elements of animal, bones to make a flute, is that in rituals you remake, vibrate the body that you have killed. So I, I replaced somehow bodies that has been killed and the burning, burning process was very important because the bones were burning and so produced the emptiness by burning them with fire. Other big uh, bells I did like this is a bell that is in the same exhibition you saw and here it's from confronting with the city that is beneath, beneath this, this empty space there is a city, the, the roofs of the city and this bell works with the wind so you see that there's a bone that is a, a reverse bell and it, it's, it's, it's an iron, it's the thickness, it's, it's uh, 1 meter 30. The, the dog is beyond, it's only the, 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 the element is more than 9 meter high. And the wind, when the wind blows, you can have a bell that says it's war, dang, 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 or you can have a bell that says someone dies, dang, dang. And what was very really interesting to me that this is kind of of natural element that we make some ritual, but we are so in, in deeply informed by this ritual that even now that normal bells are existing, we still have the impression to understand this language. And so we are, I showed it also, I don't show you the last words. <laughs> These are words from now to this last one here is 2009. I, it's, it's the last piece you saw, as you saw in the model. It was in the beginning the actor of the bell was acting the bell, and then I, I decided that the bell, the machinery of the bell, was not to be seen. It has to be ring and so. So the clock becomes a clock that reverses time. So it's going uh, in the other sense, and it has three elements of iron, very heavy that are going up like a clock, it's, it's working like a pendulum. Clock, clock, tick, 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 it's going up and then it becomes up. There's no more, nothing to help her. So she falls on and the, and the clock lost his orders. The next clock 
comes up and, and falls down. What it was very important to me was the question of a new desert without reference to other deserts. That was this image of Hiroshima and the question of time. This is the first image soldiers of Japanese soldier films of Hiroshima. What was very important to me, that because the title is Pendulum with the, with the date of the explosion of Hiroshima, is the kind of time that is coming back, like in a traumatic experience. Time is coming back, time is coming back, time is coming back. With a disorder that is coming back, a disorder that is coming back without any solution. So, when you are in front of the sculpture, you are living with this repetition of time going and time breaking, time going and time breaking, time going and time breaking. But it's a big iron thing that has nothing to do with the body, that don't love your body. If you come to here, it hits you. Um, these works of these years now, my work is a little bit different, but the works of these years are very often very aggressive structures that are good looking, but then your body can't find any position with them. So it is very important for me, and to come back to political issues, it's very important that the viewer has no position, because the viewer has to define his position when he's confronted with something. Thank you very much. is not a lost battle. Is if postmodernism told us in the 80s and as if or when more political art told us to tell us today. Um, because um, I think that uh, we, if I can answer, I can answer with two different quotes. Because I cannot answer through the question of intimacy. Um, as I um, in other words, let's say these drawings you see there are done by hammer. So I destroy plants. It's very intimate. I take the plant, I choose the plant, I'm going around over all the world and I'm, I'm collecting plants that I destroy by hammer and making by this apparatus of this own juice. So it's, it's a very deep, intimate relation I have with this question. But in the other side, and, and with trauma and with uh, there is certainly a deep relation to this. On the other hand, um, there is a, a deep interest in me for what becomes a form through a process of materiality. That means that here the Jew, Jew is, is, is making the aquarel through my hammer, but I cannot decide nothing. When I, when I, uh, when I cast bronze, I mean, put me in the process that the bell I cast, let's say, is only in wax. So if the casting doesn't work, two years of work are lost. This is not because uh, all the artists is the magnificent personage who has uh, danger and whatever. That does really not interest me. But the question that the materiality and the fire and all the transformation, like fire transforms wax into nothing, into burning, uh, material and this in the place of this burning I used burning 
bronze to get it to a thousand degrees and then it can fall only because it burns and it can be replaced only by burning. All these processes are for me to be very important. So if there is intimate, uh, something that is really anti, profoundly anti, it is possible because on the other side the world is a concrete thing that burns, that hurts, that uh, casts, that uh, you know, that is, it is in a kind of balance. I, I could not say, if, if not, but also because I grew up when in Germany was expressionist uh, returning of Neue Wild and this kind of painting where the artist is the one who expresses himself and is the subject. Like what well, Böhmer said, I paint, the main subject of my painting is myself. This in the 80s, as I was a young artist, was really awful to me. So I, I agree. But only if there's a balance. <laughs> okay, sure. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe this is a bit of a follow up. In terms of intimacy, it's a single observer, okay. it's a lonely observer. And so you also talked about what you said central to all of this is trauma, mm -hmm. so the experience of trauma, and then you have a lot of very specific examples, both in the work that you admired and showed, Demarius Lightenfield. Mm -hmm. So that image that you remembered, or that you're saying you, you have in your memory, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming you didn't experience the lightning strikes. No, I didn't. So, but you have this experience of almost the opposite, which is also a lonely experience. It's a single observer, single poles, waiting for the electrical current to come to stimulate or something. But I think a lot of the work, and even uh, the, the, the presentation before with uh, war trauma, uh, sexual violence, uh, is we're, we're attracted and impulsed by the same thing. So there's no, no one here, I, I don't know, if you, but you, you get to a point where you, you hear about the traumas in the world and you don't want to look, but then you end up looking. You watch somebody get their head cut off, you know, mm -hmm. eventually. And this goes on and on. So a lot of the production of contemporary art, at least in my education, is there, there is a centrality of trauma to it in some ways. So can you tell, tell us more about that trauma and then maybe speak to that idea of intimacy? It's never you asking yourself to reach for another human or for a collective to come to the work and experience some kind of thing collectively, but the, always the isolated individual is mm -hmm. standing on the emptiness, the danger. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. I, I think the, um, to get, um, I, I don't uh, try not to answer to the social question. This could be one answer. I don't mind. It's an isolated question of the individual. But I think that to have a, we will talk the next day in my course about how Shila thought about on this, saying that I will not quote it because it's too complicated. Say it very easily. Shila said to have to become a political thinker, an ethical ethic educated man, you have to go through experience of aesthetics, in loneliness. Let's say in more Kantian terms, to, to put up a new schemata of what you think about politics. You have to have the freedom to reorganize all schematas. So I don't think that, I think that art is highly political, and my work also is highly but I don't think that our desire of unity, of unity of point of view, of unity of history, of giving voice to uh, uh, not open, clear, sad things that are uh, hidden, that are forgotten, that are this kind of political issues that are central for political life. In art, specifically, 
I think that they cannot go through a definition of what is common. Because the perception and the singularity of memories of perception. I'm a German Italian grown up in neoliberalism. I can do nothing. <laughs> I, 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 I can't have any solution to this. This kind of memory built me up. And when now I think political issues, I cannot, let's say the example I use in my, I, we are talking in, in our course this day, is my eye is double. I see the outside coming in and the inside coming out. I have archetype images in my, let's say, coming back to the right. I have images of what has been read in Second World War, let's say, or in, uh, in Vietnam War. I have some images of this. I have any experience of this, but I construct something that becomes experience before becoming political. Interest. So the subjectivity seems to me essential to think politically. And the intimacy seems to me central, but also because I, I don't think that the characters of me they are important in my history. I am German, Italian, whatever. But I am also an abstract human being, an individual, as it was called after the revolution, French Revolution, etc. There is an individual. There is not only Bernard, born in Rome, making this and making that. There is something on inhumanity that is also the possibility to think of me as an abstract viewer. So what I look in my work is not an intimate, isolated viewer, more an abstract viewer. We talk about uh, Malevich yesterday. Uh, I think that something linked with this idea of Malevich, see, that the viewer is someone who has to be isolated, to become social. So I think art is, is the way in politics. I, I don't believe in other ways, let's say. I don't believe in parliamentary democracy, or I have to believe it's not <laughs> too depressing, but I really don't believe in, in the end. But I believe that art makes me aware, and then makes me politically work. That's why politics exists. I think aesthetic experience is the first experience, absolutely the, the main experience. And this has to do with uh, solitude, also, because I have to explain. Yeah. And I appreciate that you take the stand, because I think there's a wave of creation that, without, art, without being articulated very often, as you just have, that's looking to negate that, in a way. That particular lens or particular focus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? I mean anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can, of course, continue. Renato will be here uh, with us for quite some time. Uh, you can, you can also check what he's doing in the course. Thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, two uh, lecture presentations. Just to use this to introduce. Uh, at the program starts at seven o'clock. Uh, we have.